Hey everyone, welcome to Artists Decoded. This is your host Yoshino, and you are listening to another exciting episode. This is my conversation with my good friend, author, historian, and expert on all things related to the esoteric and the occult, the man of the hour, the man with the master plan, Mitch Horowitz. All right, so if you have never heard of Mitch before, he's famously known for his book, Occult America, The Secret History of How Mysticism Shaped Our Nation. But specifically, I wanted to bring him onto the podcast to talk about his newest book entitled Cosmic Habit Force. And in this book, Mitch makes his first detailed exploration of this intriguing and mysterious idea charted by success master Napoleon Hill. Mitch outlines 23 principles in this book, and it's incredibly helpful in creating a solid foundation for your life. So I highly suggest going online right now and purchasing it. It comes in both physical and audio form. And I personally have applied a lot of the principles that Mitch writes about in my personal life, such as the idea of the mastermind, which Mitch and I are actually in a mastermind together. And we talk about that on the pod a bit. But we also combine a few ideas from his book, The Miracle of a Definite Chief Aim in here. I'd highly suggest to get that book too in combination with Cosmic Habit Force. In this episode, we give two examples of famous definite chief aims in this podcast from martial artist Bruce Lee and science fiction writer Octavia E. Butler. I feel like a lot of you will find what we talk about to be very practical and useful, so I hope all of you enjoy it. But before we begin, please go to our iTunes page, leave us that solid five-star review, and Spotify recently created a rating system, so if you go there, please just smash that five-star like button, you know, like all the YouTubers say. Just smash it, please, for us, please. All right, anyways, uh, let's begin the episode. Here's my conversation with Mitch Horowitz. Hope you enjoy it. All right, my man. Thanks for doing this. Glad to be here, man. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So I pulled a quote from you from your book, Cosmic Habit Force. And do you mind if I read it to you real quick? Lay it on me, please. When nature has a message to convey to mankind, she does not release it to those who are indulging in dissipation, nor does she hand it over to those who have been pampered and protected from struggle. But she picks as her torchbearers those who have been seasoned by defeat until they have become self-determining. And so I picked this particular one just because I thought it was very profound. But also, just for the listeners out there, what exactly is Cosmic Habit Force? Well, Cosmic Habit Force is a term and a concept that comes from the work of Napoleon Hill. And it basically is the equivalent to what we might consider transcendental purpose and the cosmic cycles of nature that maintain life and all of its regularity, including revolutions, changes, usurpations. It's basically a kind of real-time karma in which cultivating certain habits actions and outlooks are going to result in desired outcomes, barring some profoundly countervailing force. So it's a way of placing the natural forces of life at the back of your aims. Hmm. And can you give me a personal example of how cosmic habit force has shaped your life? Absolutely. I mean, we all know, for example, that certain behaviors can result in catastrophe. You know, if we indulge in certain things toward which we have an addictive proclivity, that's eventually going to take our lives. Mm. But likewise, uh, certain behaviors and outlooks can also result in the extraordinary. So for example, 
if you can grok to the kind of work that you're authentically passionate for in a real true way that goes right down to the bone, like I have with writing, it puts incredible energies and forces at your back. People always say to me, wow, your output is prodigious. You must be really disciplined. And in fact, I don't really see discipline as among my great strengths, but I do love writing. I want to write more than I want to eat. I want to write more than I want to sleep. And so <laughs> I dedicate myself to yeah. it with a kind of single-minded passion. And that would be an example of cosmic habit force. If you can bring yourself into alignment with natural forces of life, like the way that energy translates into the way that passion translates into energy or the way that focus translates into power or the way that persistence translates into deliverance of some sort or another, you're putting certain natural forces uh, at the back of your efforts. Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. Recently, I, I don't know if you've read this. Um, so it's an or originally a novel by Osamu Dazai um, called no, no Longer Human. But Juji Ito um, created a graphic novel about this book called mm -hmm. No Longer Human. And it's essentially, it's, it's kind of hard to say exactly what it's about because it's so surreal. I, I don't know if, are you familiar with Junji Ito's work at all? I'm not, I'm afraid. So a lot of his work is like body horror and um, kind of these very surrealistic elements where people turn into these monsters and those sort of things. But I think a lot of it has to do with Japanese relationships to the spirit world and those sort of things. But this particular book talks about how one man, you know, a lot of things happened to him as a child and he was molested and how constantly there's things within his life. You know, he's constantly lying mm -hmm. to himself about certain things. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, it's essentially not dealing with pain and trauma. And um, it, it widely speaks about depression, which I think is a good thing to bring up because, uh, like, partially because of this book. You know, uh, something that, that comes to mind in particular when I, when I think about when I was reading your book is that Henry David Thoreau quote, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. But I also wanted to read the entirety of that quote because I think a lot of people just reference that one line. And it'll lead me to a question. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, okay. All right, cool, cool. Lay it on the me. mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city you go into the desperate country and have to console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed even under what we even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. There is no play in them, for this comes after work, but it is a characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. And so that's the entirety of that quote from Henry David Thoreau from Civil Disobedience and other essays. And so combining those two ideologies, the Junji Ito book and this quote from Henry David Thoreau, why do you think people settle for lives of mediocrity? Well, I think that mediocrity has a certain pull on us to begin with. Mediocrity involves entertainment, it involves consumption, it involves accepting repetitive thrills and enjoyments, and in a certain sense, it must be said that mediocrity is not without its pleasures. You know, people will complain bitterly about maybe something that they wanted in life, some dream that was unattained, and yet, to a degree we are all willing to trade certain greater aspects of life for certain lesser aspects of life. And these lesser aspects of life present themselves very easily. You can usually get away with starting your job, you know, a few minutes late, ending your job mm -hmm. a few minutes early, doing the bare minimum to get by, uh, shop online, buy some goodies, uh, eat, um, 
relatively inexpensive, pleasurable food, consume alcohol, take drugs, mm -hmm. uh, surf porn, um, binge watch shows. And I'm not trying to place myself above any of this stuff. I'm just saying that it's omnipresent and the trade-offs of mediocrity can be a certain degree of comfort, but there's also that quiet desperation to which Thoreau referenced. Excessive consumption is usually a salve for feeling divorced from your own sense of self-expression. And mm. self-expression takes a great deal of work. And I think that a lot of what passes for neurosis in our culture, a lot of what passes for low-grade depression or anxiety is actually a paucity of self expression. Now, self-expression can take any number of forms. It can be the creative arts. It can be uh, athleticism. It can be martial arts. It can be starting a business. It can be uh, getting down with people you love on some project or something. But my sense is that we are, without exception, cr creative beings. That doesn't mean that we're going to act in the direction of self-expression, because as I was alluding, there's a lot of stuff that can supplant and replace self-expression. And uh, depending where you live, it can be pretty accessible. Hmm. So we make these trade-offs all the time and we fall asleep with a bag of chips on our lap, you know, binge watching, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And, you know, at the same time, uh, the individual could be doing something with his or her life that would avert a sense of great regret, maybe as the years peter out. But it's a, it's a trade-off. And, and mediocrity versus self-expression, I think both ends of that polarity have their rewards. The greater reward in my personal experience, having visited both poles, is self-expression. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I and yeah, it's that's a re really interesting. And I think that's why David Foster Wallace talks about his mm, like reasons why he didn't want to watch TV mm -hmm. or why he didn't have a television around. Mm -hmm. And um that's the sort of all-consuming nature of these vices, right? Um that take away from his particular purpose, which was writing, obviously. And um I think you know, because we live in such a consumerist culture where anyone's vices can be easily accessed or, you know, any sort of, um, this leads me to this question. So like, what are some things that people can do to get out of it? It seems to me one critical first step that is within everyone's reach but that most of us never do because it sounds too familiar is ask yourself with complete brutal frankness, self-honesty and a lack of embarrassment. What do you really want in life? What do you really want in life? And don't listen to the things you've told yourself in the past. And especially don't listen to the voice that says, well, I already know the voice that responds quickly to that question. Mm -hmm. Quickness is habit. Quickness is familiarity. Quickness is rote thought. Take time completely in private and completely on your own without disclosing it to anybody. And as I said, with a total absence of embarrassment to ask yourself what you want in life. And we think, I mean, you know, as you were very rightly alluding, we live in a society that is so oriented towards satisfaction, so much so that we think of our wants as something that we're in touch with, aware of, maybe they're out of reach sometimes, maybe sometimes closer, maybe sometimes further. But I think actually that what we identify as self-disclosure is very often conditioned by mm. peer pressure, uh, by yeah. what we think we're supposed to tell ourselves, by what, and even when we're just speaking internally within the confines of our own psyche, we're repeating things by rote. We're framing things by rote based on how we think we are supposed to look to others. And it's very pernicious. And this way of thought really gets its claws into us. I'm saying, take an afternoon, take an evening, 
to completely exit that framework. First, you have to realize that there is such a framework <laughs> and forget about <laughs> what, yeah. what you've been telling yourself and sit down yeah. with a paper and pencil and just, again, in complete privacy this exercise is exquisitely your own yeah don't tell your shrink don't tell your boyfriend or girlfriend don't tell your significant other don't tell your neighbor mike just do it you know and and it's yours it's private but know what you want even if you think it's realistic or unrealistic just just set aside that that judgment just for the time being there'll be plenty of time to revisit that and there are productive ways to revisit that but what a tragedy it would be not to at least know. So start by knowing, start by knowing mm -hmm. and, and at least have the coordinates. And, and then there's all kinds of different ways to, to deal with those coordinates. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically acknowledge that you're the fish in the fishbowl. Well, at least in terms <laughs> of how stuff gets taken away from us, you know, we, and that's, yeah, the, actually that's a really good way of putting it. I mean, just look at the language we use in our society and it's not, it's, it's not wrong in the sense that we have to engage in some sort of generality in order to communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, we'll speak in terms of uh, higher and lower uh, or in the religious realm, you know, God and devil, or in the spiritual psychological realm, um, spirituality and essence. Who told you any of those things exist? You know, who told you that those are the polarities of life? Well, you know, here within Western society, certain ideas, and this is true of every society, certain ideas have been repeated over millennia or over centuries, and that repetition takes on the dent of foundational truth. So there must be higher, lower, there must be personality essence, there must be, you know, God, devil, there must be uh, all these different frameworks that we immediately reach to function within. And some people can explore really wonderful, extraordinary things within those frameworks. Although at times, as the philosopher Jacob Needleman once put it to me, um, exploring creatively within those frameworks can be like having the nicest cell in the prison. You know, you've just got the greatest, most well-outfitted <laughs> cell in the whole prison. Wow. Congratulations. You know, yeah. so I invite people, at least just as a personal experiment, to ask, how do I know this is true? You know, I remember mm -hmm. once in a spiritual setting, I brought up a question to the senior member of an esoteric group mm -hmm. I was part of, and he misheard my question, but, but his response was, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And instead of acknowledging that or defending myself or whatever, I just thought to myself, how do I know that? How do I know there are no shortcuts on the so-called spiritual path? By spiritual, I mean extra physical. How do I know there aren't accelerants to having some sort of greater, fuller experience? How do I know? Yeah. You know, And so that became like a formative moment in my life because I suddenly felt that at least insofar as the personal search is concerned, it wasn't incumbent upon me to accept these languages and definitions that form the fishbowl that you're referring to. Of course, in outer life, some generality is necessary. I mean, I, I can't tell somebody linear time isn't real and not show up for something or, you know, <laughs> at least not at the cost of being a real asshole. You know, I mean, I have to, <laughs> we all have to agree on certain consensual coordinates to just get through life, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not going to sit around arguing that water isn't wet, you know, when I need to get something done, when, you know, I've promised somebody to help him with something or whatever it may be. But in terms of your personal search, you're completely free. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to function within the fishbowl. Yeah. Yeah. I think that a lot of us get caught in these, in these societal norms where we think that there are specific steps along the way. Uh, I think that we've been conditioned to think that way from a very young age, from going to school, um, you know, going to preschool and kindergarten and elementary school and then going to middle school and then high school and then going to college. And, and then from college, you have to have some sort of career in mind and then you have to, you know, and so on and so forth. Right. But really those ideas are structured from a, from the industrial revolution, right. To essentially mm -hmm. support industry Mm -hmm. And so we live in a much different time now where you can create, um, if you're very honest with your desires and your needs and your wants, and we can go later into the mastermind, but um, if you're very honest with those things, 
to be able to manifest them in reality. And I think that's what we're talking about here. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, which brings me to this idea that I've been ruminating on a lot through your books, through the miracle of the definite chief aim, and also in Cosmic Habit Force, you reference that same ideology as a definite purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to bring up this kind of typical quote that a lot of people that a lot of people say, but um, this famous quote from theologian Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find once they reach a top that the ladder is leaning against a wrong wall. And so I think that's why it's very, very important to understand, first of all, that time is a, a, a construct that we all have to work within, right? We only have a certain amount of time to our to our lives, whether that's 20 years or whether that's, you know, a hundred years. Uh, and we're not in control of like how we're going to die necessarily. But I think it's incumbent upon us to be very honest, like you're saying, being brutally honest with exactly what you want out of life, even if it's painful. Because a lot of the times it is because of the social conditioning to not ask ourselves with the most frank, brutal honesty, what do we want out of life? What do we truly want? And I think that that's why people run into the midlife crisis because they've been following these steps along the way that we're talking about and end up not being very happy, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think that what I've been thinking about is there's this gift within an existential crisis and there there's a fork in the road that splits do you follow the road less traveled or do you follow the road of the societal norms which you think that you should be doing as opposed to what you actually should be doing with your life and so um i guess for those out there that don't know what a definite chief aim is how would you describe that a definite chief aim is something that you wish for with absolute singular passion, and it forces you to make an uncomfortable choice about the entire direction towards which your life is dedicated. And people don't want to do that because they very understandably argue that, well, life throws all kinds of different things at you. Every one of us has to function in different roles a parent, a caregiver, a worker, an artist. And I agree. I agree. I'm all those things myself. But I would argue that everyone you admire in life, if you could name a person living or dead, who you deeply and profoundly admire, you would really probably find out and you'd know instinctively and very quickly that that person essentially lived for one thing. He or she may have done many different things, but I also point out that a single aim can touch many different bases in life. So choose carefully. You know, a single aim could invariably will affect your relationships in all kinds of different ways. It could affect your relationships in ways that are very positive for you, not always necessarily positive for other people. Like let's say you want to dedicate yourself to a certain craft or a certain art or a certain form of movement, whether it's dance, martial arts, whatever. Well, that's going to inform the company you keep. That's going to inform what time you get up and go to bed. That's going to inform what you eat. That's going to inform all kinds of things. Yeah. And there may be people who are eager for you to come out with them and like knock back beers and chicken wings and, you know, watch the game on television. And that has its place. But if, if, if somebody's a martial artist, for example, or a ballerina and is getting up at five in the morning to practice, well, they ain't going to be spending much nights out, you know, <laughs> knocking <laughs> back beer and chicken wings. And that's going to disappoint <laughs> some people, you know, yeah. but one aim can touch a lot of different things, a lot of different things. But uh, it's a tough bargain life makes with us, you know, because I do believe that concentration produces force. We see that in nature all the time. We wave air currents out of the way, but concentrated they can be as powerful as a bullet. And this is true again and again across nature. I mean, there's dozens of examples. So if that's true in terms of the psyche, and I believe it is, if that's true in terms of human dedication, I believe it is, it's a tough bargain because it's wonderful because it does suggest the road to someplace that the individual wants to get, but it also suggests 
uh, there are choices to be made and there are things that fall by the wayside. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really good to think about your perspective in a situation that seems to be a failure Mm -hmm. at a time Mm -hmm. because that failure. So maybe it's a big life event, like someone gets a divorce or, um, someone gets broken up with because they want to follow their definite chief aim, that can actually be a gift because you can allow yourself the freedom to be open and pursue without any sort of setbacks. Yeah. You know? So I think to be able, I mean, it's very Taoist in a certain way, you know, also because, you know, I think we're in, uh, our culture deems things to be good or bad, but really there's a, a paradox that exists between the two, right? Something that you might perceive to be bad at that particular time could actually be really good for you, but with distance and time and a lot of uh, conscious examination, whether that be through journaling or whatever that may be, you can have some sort of perspective on the situation, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, failure is a topic I try to deal with very head on in the book because it's enormously painful. And we've all had instances where we failed. Uh, marriages failed, relationships have broken up, or maybe somebody wanted uh, a certain kind of job or accomplishment or whatever, and it just didn't, it didn't work. But I think that when you're on the path of a definite chief aim, and when you're really working at it with everything that's in you, you come to see certain circumstances in light of their potential for development, even if they're painful. And I've had my share of painful circumstances. I mean, I've been saved by painful circumstances. I've been saved by yeah, me too. things that I wanted with everything in me. I mean, that I wanted with all my guts yeah. and I didn't get them and I, I felt terrible. And, you know, I, I, I would just ask myself, whether there's some way to regain what I've lost or some way to recollect my efforts and go charging back at that same hill. But then sometimes in the lighter perspective, I've been unbelievably relieved. I mean, like palpably relieved, almost like averting a car crash. Mm. And I feel it with the same sense of euphoria that you yeah. feel that sense of alarm and adrenaline and relief and euphoria that you feel when you've averted a crash, you know, I, uh, certain so-called failures, they may have proven to be a setback or a switchback or something, but they've thrown me back on the nature of my wish. And sometimes, sometimes they do actually get me away from bad company. A lot of mm. frustrations occur. A lot of dead ends occur because we're in bad company. Yeah. And I think uh, it's critical to get away from people who don't support you or demean you or who are cruel and that includes friends, so-called friends who make diminishing jokes or things of that nature. That stuff just takes the life out of our skin. Yeah. We, we Death by a thousand cuts. Of it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's a pretty good description of life. <laughs> yeah, you know. definitely. Yeah. And I think that by really embedding yourself and understanding honestly what that definite chief aim is, it gives you some sort of life force to be able to continually reference so that when you do run into those failures, it gives you the perspective that these things are for you and they're not yeah. happening to you. So it takes you out of that mindset of, Oh, I'm the victim here. So I'm curious, like what is something as an example, if you're willing to share, what is an example of something that has happened to you that with time and perspective was actually a good thing, even though it maybe at the time you perceived it as being a very terrible thing? Sure. I'll share something very explicit. Um, in the year 2006, I was ensconced in another career. I was working in publishing and I was a editor at an imprint at Penguin Random House. And there was a, a publisher uh, on Long Island who I really thought highly of, and I wanted to become an executive at this publishing company. It had just been sold to a different uh, corporate parent, and I had a sense that this place was sort of hanging in balance. They could either fall 
uh, off of one side of a possibility or another side of the possibility. One side would represent the preservation of what had made them great. Another side would represent embarking in new directions that were probably likely to obfuscate and devalue the things that were great about the company. So uh, be uh, be that right or wrong, I went out there and I met the president and I was really excited with the prospect of working there. And it seemed really positive and possible. And not only did I not wind up working there, but the guy actually stole some of my book ideas. I mean, I literally sat in his office having this lovely chat with him for a couple of hours. And sometime later, he put out knockoff versions of some of the very ideas that I sat there talking to him about, which really mm. disappointed me. And then yeah. um, he was out of there fairly quickly. And then there was a new guy in the same position. And I got together with the new guy and I might be uh, foolishly open, but being open is part of my life. I mean, that's how I'm able to offer this example. I talked, had the same conversation with his replacement, his successor, same thing happened. He stole some of my book ideas. I mean, just stole them red handed. He was out of there pretty soon. And I was very disappointed with the whole experience because not only did I uh, not wind up getting an executive position there, not only were they not interested in bringing me on board, but I was played for a sucker. And uh, when you're open about ideas, once in a while, you do get played for a sucker, although I, I continue to be open about them because getting burned rarely in such situations rarely um, is the final verdict on the matter. And that was the case here. Um, what actually wound up happening is shortly after that period of time, uh, the 2008 recession hit and that company, which had made some very poor decisions, uh, mm -hmm. wound up laying off people like crazy. And I realized that had I gone there, I would have been presiding over a funeral instead of spending Friday afternoons uh, writing and editing and and publishing and so forth, I would have been laying people off, which is the last thing that any decent person wants to do. And so weirdly enough, I shortly became editor in chief of the imprint that I was at. So I was able to enact some of the ideas and some of the things I wanted to do at that very imprint. And I was particularly proud of that because after the 2008 recession hit, which saw the closure of the national bookstore chain borders, not one person at my imprint lost his or her job. Not one person. It's the thing I'm proudest of in my time in publishing. And whereas at the other company, they were laying off the staff in droves. Also, uh, shortly thereafter, I got my first book contract for my book, Occult America. If I had been uh, running another publishing company, if I had been the executive in charge of a publishing company, I wouldn't have had the time to dedicate myself to the writing, the media, the research that was necessary. So I got a promotion at my other shop. Uh, I got a book contract. I was able to save people from getting fired during a recession. I was able to do the things that I would have, that I wanted to do at this other shop. And mm -hmm. I, I, I had time to do the stuff I wanted, you know, rather than uh, uh, trying to direct a sinking or, or at least a waterlogged ship. So I was saved and I was depressed as hell, you know, after I, uh, yeah. couldn't get anywhere at the other place. I was depressed as hell after these guys, uh, swiped uh, my ideas. I mean, it was really depressing outcome. And yet mm. it was my rescue. It was my deliverance. And those were books that you wanted to write or those are books that you wanted to publish from other authors? Uh, they publishing. were books that I wanted to publish as part of a public domain program. I felt at the time that public domain publishing was an untapped resource, which it really was. Yeah. And and so I was speaking from the perspective of certain public domain works and programs. And uh, those were the those were some of the books I had in mind. Mm, I see. So, you know, going back to the definite chief aim and... Um, I'm going to ask you this question and then after I want to read two definite chief aims just to give people an example of what exactly those can look like. But what came first for you, the book Occult America or the definite chief aim, or did they come simultaneously? It's an interesting question. I'm, I'm trying to turn my mind back. I think the definite chief aim must have come first. Uh, there was some concurrency, but I knew at a certain point, uh, particularly when I was in my late 30s and I had rediscovered myself as a writer after many years of dormancy, that, I mean, it almost announced itself to me. Writing was what I wanted to do over and above everything else, over and above executive positions, 
independent startups, you name it. Writing was what I wanted. Hmm. So what, what, what held exactly held you back from, um, just going directly into being a writer as opposed to what you did, um, going into public, being a publisher? Well, after I got out of school, I worked at a daily newspaper as a journalist and I really didn't like it. I was very, very unhappy. And so I left after about five months and I, I realized in leaving that it was, and I write about this in the Miracle Club, it was a really heavy, heavy decision. It was really, really hard because I didn't feel like I was doing my best work. I didn't like the work I was doing. It may have just been the wrong job, wrong paper, wrong town. I don't know. But I remember I got back to my apartment one night uh, and I fell to my knees and I prayed that I would um, have the bravery to get out of this field rather than be a mediocrity in it. And so I was either going to dedicate myself to the field or I was going to get out, but I was not going to stick around as a mediocrity. So I got out and it was a heavy decision because, you know, when you leave your first job after five months, I was very young. I guess I was 22, something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that door does not swing the opposite way. I mean, you're you're exiting. You know, you you have to have a pretty damn good reason for leaving your chosen career after five months. So I, I regarded that decision with a, uh, a deep, deep amount of seriousness and, 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 and a heavy heart because I, I, I knew that I was going to be walking out that door all but for good. And I got into publishing and I stayed in book publishing for a long time and it did some good things for me, but I felt a sense of emptiness. I felt a sense of directionlessness. I didn't really like being behind the camera, so to speak. I knew I mm. wanted to be in front of the camera yeah. and I was... I was disappointed. I was I was somewhat melancholy about the whole thing, even though I had spent years in publishing. And I remember I would say to friends, I don't feel like I stand for anything. And they would always say, oh, no, don't don't say that. You're doing all kinds of great things. But I knew I was telling myself the truth. And hmm. then uh, in the summer of 2003, I think I was about 36 years old, something like that, um, a magazine called Science of Mind came to me and they asked me if I wanted to interview the Major League Baseball pitcher, Barry Zito, who used to pitch Mm -hmm. for the San Francisco Giants. And Barry used certain metaphysical principles as part of his training regimen. And I said, yeah, I'd be delighted. And, And I interviewed Barry and I wrote this piece called Barry's Way about how he combined his metaphysical outlook with athletic training. And it just turned on a light for me. I suddenly realized... I did want to be a writer. I did want to rediscover myself as a writer. But now for the first time ever, I knew what I wanted to write about, which was metaphysics in history and practice. And Mm. that was incredibly helpful because I I didn't even know what I wanted to write about. I knew I wasn't a fiction writer. I didn't really want to write about politics or social criticism directly. I didn't want to be a critic. I didn't want to be a guy, you know, reviewing things precisely. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the path I wanted. And and suddenly, when I wrote this profile of Barry, I discovered what I really wanted. And his uh, his father, Joe Zito, who's now deceased, called me up about two weeks after the piece came out. I was seated at my desk. Joe didn't have my number. I never knew him, never met him before. And he said to me, Mitch, you listen to me. You stick with this thing. And it was so affirming because what he meant by you stick with this thing was you stick with writing about hmm. the metaphysical. Like he got it. He saw what I was after. It was magical. And and so I stuck with it. And and th- th- that's what answered my need. Hmm. What was, um, what's an example of something that Barry Zito did that connected his athleticism with my metaphysics? Well, he was really into the principle that thoughts are causative. So he was interested in certain mind metaphysics teachers, particularly Neville Goddard, who he exposed me mm, to. Yeah. I and that. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So Barry would practice just unceasingly. I mean, just unceasingly ever since he had been a little kid, they had a pitching mound in their backyard. He was always working, working, working. And he would read Ernest Holmes and uh, Neville Goddard. I remember in particular Holmes and Goddard were his two critical areas of interest and his parents um joe was dad and uh 
gosh, m- mom was Rhonda. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, mm-hmm. I might not be, but they were, they had their own spiritual movement, uh, which ran in the family called teachings of the inner Christ. And it was basically a mm-hmm. positive mind mysticism, you know, that, that it's similar to Neville, that your thoughts are what is symbolically called God and they out picture. And so Barry would write affirmations on the inner rim of his cap and he would, you know, go through like very serious training sessions with his father where they might read like an Ernest Holmes essay or a Neville chapter and they would dig like super deep into it, maybe the night before like a big practice or something. And so he would get his mental game going, he would get his physical game going, he saw them as united and he became the hero of the 2012 World Series pitching for the Giants. Wow. That's amazing. Like, yeah. um, yeah. And I think, you know, just speaking towards positive mind metaphysics and also, I mean, in this book, you, you talk about the, uh, PMA, the positive mental attitude. And, you know, I think it's really important to understand even people that are closest to us that really love us, that they have their own projections of reality you know, so I think it's very important to understand going back to, you know, the definite chief aim, like what we stand for, right? And to reinforce that with PMA, with positive mental, a positive mental attitude. And um, I'm curious, have you ever read The Inner Game of Tennis? I have not. I've heard of it. Never read it. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good book um, regarding... Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's Taoist in the sense of staying very present in the moment with the thing that you're doing so that you essentially become the art form as opposed Mm -hmm. to thinking and then, you know, uh, and then hitting the ball or, you know, and it can be, uh, in the sense of what I'm akin to, like the fighting arts, um, boxing, you know, it's like you practice something over and over and over again to where it's just automatic almost. And so you're staying completely present in the moment. But, um, I want to go back to the definite chief aims because I think this is a very important topic. Um, so I want to read two chief aims, um, one from Bruce Lee and one from Octavia Butler. Uh, I'm going to read Octavia's first. So Octavia Butler is a uh, science fiction writer. For those who don't know, I'm sure everyone knows who Bruce Lee is. But um, okay, I shall be a best-selling writer after Imago. Each of my books will be on the bestsellers list of the LA Times, New York Times, and then she states a couple of other different publications. My novels will go on to the above list, whether publishers push them hard or not, whether I'm paid a high advance or not, whether I ever win another award or not. This is my life. I write best-selling novels. My novels go on to the bestsellers list on or shortly after publication. My novels each travel up to the top of the bestsellers list and they reach the top and they stay on the top for months. Each of my novels does this. And then she goes on to reaffirming this to herself. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I'm just going to read it. So be it. I will find the way to do this. See to it. So be it. See to it. My books will be read by millions of people! Exclamation point. I will buy a beautiful home in an excellent neighborhood. I will send poor black youngsters to Clarion or other writers' workshops. I will help poor black youngsters broaden their horizons. I will help poor black youngsters go to college. I will get the best of health care for my mother and myself. I will hire a car whenever I want or need to. I will travel whenever and wherever in that world that I choose. My books will be read by millions of people. So be it. See to it. Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. And this was a super powerful one. And then I'm going to read the Bruce Lee one now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, Bruce Lee, will be the first highest paid oriental superstar in the United States. In return, I will give the most exciting performances and render the best quality in the capacity of an actor. 
Starting in 1970, I will achieve world fame. And from then onward to the end of 1980, I will have in my possession $10 million. I will live the way I please and achieve inner harmony and happiness. Bruce Lee. So I guess, you know, my question from this too is, you know, these are very single-minded purpose-driven, right? But what would you say to people who have multiple interests or purposes? I know you touch on this a bit, but I want to ask the question directly. I would say that life yields to focus and that having multiple having a, a singular definite chief aim as 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 passionately defined as the ones you just heard and and as defined in as concentrated a manner as the ones you just heard doesn't mean that you won't have other obligations in life uh, and it doesn't mean that in fact your aim won't feed and help those other obligations for example i i have two sons you know um one of them is right outside the studio. And as soon as mm-hmm. you and I are done, he and I are going to go see the Batman, he for the second time. And Oh, wow. And nice. yeah, and then we'll get Indian food. And, you know, so um, that's the plan. And, that sounds great. Yeah. And Bruce Lee was a parent. Uh, Octavia Butler had a mom you know, she had to care for. And she obviously was very concerned with getting kids educated and so forth. And nobody would say that either person took a go it alone attitude to life or that they were selfish. I look at someone like Bill Wilson, for example, the co-founder of AA, you know, Bill's aim in life was to help people get sober, period. You know, that Mm -hmm. was Bill's aim in life. Now there were any number of other things that Bill did with his existence, but that was, that was it. And I think that, Again, life strikes a tough bargain with us. I think we do get some iteration of what we want, barring some extreme countervailing measure. And there are extreme countervailing measures that occur in this world. We live under many different laws and forces. And I would say, however, that for most of us, most of us, most of the time, we're not dealing with extreme countervailing measures. It does occur. But for most of us... um, life is not demarcated by the extraordinary, the unmentionable, the, the, the outrageously unexpected, although it does, it does happen. I mean, I can think of people from a museum in Ukraine with whom I was on a conference call two years ago. And I often think about where are these people now? What's happening? They were building a Holocaust memorial and I was sitting in on a consulting session. And, Mm. um, you know, I mean, these were, Uh, people a lot like uh, your listeners, you know, and we were having a perfectly good conversation over the course of a couple of hours on a winter day um, in 2020. And I often think about where are they now? Are they alive? Are they in shelters? Are they refugees? It's so sad, you know? Yeah. So I honor the fact that, and I know that, that catastrophe strikes or extreme countervailing measures strike, but that's not an excuse for the individual not to be organized in his thinking because, you know, when that happens, survival becomes paramount above everything else, but that doesn't happen to most people most of the time. And so when I talk about singularity of focus and I describe that as a tough bargain, the life strikes with us. I do believe that in most cases there is some kind of deliverance. There are also outer events, laws and forces under which we live. I don't believe that the law of mind, although I do take seriously, I do believe that there's an extra physical causative quality to mind. I don't believe it's this mental super law and we experience nothing else. That's not my point of view. That's why I write so regularly and steadily within the space of mind metaphysics, because I don't take a perspective on the law of mind that it's always felt or experienced the same way, or that it's this one super law under which we live. We live Mm. as, as I've said, you know, under within a dynamic framework of things, the mind is one tool among others. The mind is one force of consequence among others, but we neglect it. We neglect it in its full powers and capacities. Yeah. Well, I say this with, you know, deep compassion towards what's going on. In the Ukraine right now, but to your point, um, you know, I want to take one out of Viktor Frankl's book, um, mm-hmm. 
by finding meaning out of the suffering. And I know that you and I can state this from a point of privilege because our country isn't under attack like Ukraine's is right now. But I think, you know, I mean, I wasn't uh, like my great grandparents, um, you know, they came to this country from Japan to start a new life and then all of their land was taken from them hmm. uh, and never given back to them, which would be, you know, multi multiple millions of dollars worth of hmm. land in Watsonville, California. And it's a project that I'm actually working on. I, I submitted for a grant to, to work on this project too. Mm -hmm. But anyways, the point is, is, you know, from the actions and from the stories, what I know is that my great grandfather who is very driven, you know, to make something for himself in this country, uh, that debilitated him. He turned into a <laughs> drunk, you know, No kidding. Wow. Yeah. So, um, what am I trying to say with that? I mean, we've all been through certain tragedies within our lives and traumatic events. And I think that in order for us to continue as healthily as possible, and I'm, like I said, I'm saying this with lots of compassion that we have to find some sort of meaning out of that suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Like to consistently be in the victim mindset it does not do us good doesn't mean that we can't grieve loss uh but we do need to find some sort of meaning to continue right because life mm -hmm. continues whether mm -hmm. we endure that suffering or not um but i guess so what i did want to go into is fear because mm -hmm. fear is a big part of your book mm -hmm. and uh i'm curious what you do personally to subvert that fear or mm -hmm. when those negative uh thoughts drift into the mind uh of doubt what do you do or maybe what's in the book that 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 helps you what did you write that helps you well there's several things that I do, and I, I always like to point out that uh, spiritual means and other means are not mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to be all one thing or the other. I've struggled with anxiety all my life. I've, As I often say, I've never been depressed for a day in my life, or at least not much more than a day, but anxiety mm -hmm. is something that I always have to deal with. And it's very serious, and it's not a joke. I mean, it's been a nagging presence in my life ever since I've been a little kid. And so I do several things. First of all, uh, and I'm going to be very practical because I, I'm not going to put up with, I don't put up with any inexactitude when people are talking about philosophies of life, because the question, does it work, is a test before which every ethical and spiritual philosophy has to stand and subject itself to. Number one, I sit in transcendental meditation twice a day. That's a mantra-based form of meditation. I happen to find it very relaxing. I think its effects are cumulative, so that's that's part of my commitment. Two, I, I, and I like to be very upfront about this and very unembarrassed about speaking to this. I take an uh, SNRI, a, a psychopharmacological drug, and I have experimented with different SSRIs, SNRIs. I have not found all of them effective. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are very individualized. I found one recently that I found effective. I take it. It's part of my retinue. It's part of my way of getting through life. And again, um, I don't care whether anybody hears this as ironic or they have some brief against pharmacological drugs or pharmaceutical companies or what have you. I'm being frank because I'm speaking to the individual as I would speak to uh, one of my own closest friends. I mean, I, I'm not here to uh, offer, I'm not here to look good is basically what I'm saying. I'm, yeah. I'm here to tell the truth. And I, uh, I, I don't want to see pharmacological drugs stigmatized. There are some people, especially people who are suffering from uh, psychoses or severe emotional disorders or bipolar or what have you absolutely need them. Mm. So, you know, I'm the last person on earth who's going to say that, Something like that is unspiritual. I'm also wearing eyeglasses right now as I'm speaking. Is that unspiritual? <laughs> because I need to adjust my vision. So <clears throat> at yeah. number three, um, I pray 
and I'm, I take a very radically independent approach to prayer. I often encourage people to identify a deity just much as our ancient ancestors did. There doesn't have to be some monotheistic or, or traditional Western or Eastern paradigm. I, I believe very deeply in matters of affinity when identifying energies that our ancient ancestors personified, sought relationships with, petitioned. Um, that's just part of my search, part of my work. Uh, I work very hard in the direction of my definite chief aim, which is to document metaphysics in <laughs> practice and history. I'm, I'm working all the time and I, for the most part, enjoy the hell out of it. And, and you'd be surprised that, um, when you're working towards what you wish for, whatever it may be, and there can be any vast number of things, um, that's a salve to fear. It's a salve to fear. Fear sometimes comes when we feel like we're not doing what we're supposed to do. I also make every effort, and I would encourage everyone to make every effort to get away from cruel people, people who make you feel afraid, diminished, or inferior. Are It's eroding your life. It's taking away your energy. And watch very carefully in these situations because bullies always have plausible denial. That's the genius of the bully. Whatever he or she says to you that's diminishing, that's detracting, can always be attributed to your misunderstanding or you're overly sensitive or yeah. uh, I was only joking. You know, Those are situations where you <laughs> should watch very, very carefully for the danger of predatory personalities. Uh, predatory personalities run riot throughout our culture. In the book, I estimate that probably a huge percentage of people, maybe up to 50%, fall under what might be called predatory behavioral traits, which I write about in the book, and people can compare it to their own experience and see whether they think it's valid. But in any case, you should never put up with jokes or slights or passive aggressive remarks or gaslighting or anything that makes you feel inferior. That will erode you. That will, that will, that will gut you. Yeah. And, uh, and it, and it inures fear in you. So those are some steps I take very plainly to deal with fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that predatory nature is also just a symptom of this capitalistic society that we live in. You know, I mean, we don't live in a collectivist sort of culture. I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure a majority of people can say that they don't know exactly what their neighbor is doing or, you know, or constantly have them over for dinner or, you know, have sort of like a communal environment. I think... um, which I think is a huge disservice to just like joy and our humanity, which is also reinforced by, um, which is also reinforced by, you know, negative aspects of social media, which you talk Mm -hmm. about this, um, you talk about that in your book. Um, and so, which I think, you know, the antidote to that is this idea of the golden rule and something that I like specifically about this book of yours, you talked about speaking poorly about others mm-hmm. actually hurts you in the end. Without question. And yeah, and and I just think I was thinking about that a lot and just like this need for people to gossip about other people. Yeah. And how negative those trains of thought are. And I think it's really important to be able to open that up and examine that within ourselves because we only have responsibility for ourselves to understand why we would do that, why we would gossip about another person. And, you know, no one, no one's perfect, right? It happens. But when it does happen to be able to recognize why the fuck am I doing this? Why did yeah, I speak poorly yeah. about that person, right? Um, well, you know, I, mm-hmm. I often say that if you want to fail, trash talk. <laughs> and if you want to fail <laughs> often, trash talk often. Guarantee. Uh, yeah, yeah. Reciprocity will will make itself felt. In yeah, life. yeah. So reciprocity, <laughs> the law of reciprocity works both positively and negative, negatively in that respect, right? Absolutely. So if you talk poorly about someone else to someone else, right? then they uh, recognize that and observe that within you, right? That you are a type of person that speaks negatively about other people. So then uh, as a sort of response to that, like if, if, if someone was consistently gossiping about other people to me, then I'll record that within my mind and say like, you know, 
it's some sort of a manifestation within itself, right? Yeah, I think we internalize whatever we express over time, over time. And yeah. the, the when we trash talk or when we gossip for entertainment, just for a thrill, just putting somebody down because we have an opportunity to be a smart ass and we take it, you know, it's nothing to do with social justice or anything else. And in fact, quite a few times we, we wear the costume of social justice when all we're really interested in doing is throwing a rock at another person. And we sort of mm -hmm. uh, disguise the act as, as, as one of virtue. So it's just something we should really watch for. I have very little faith in human nature. I mean, I, I have faith <laughs> in the individual who's, who yeah. strives, you know, I have faith in an Octavia Butler. I have faith in a Bruce Lee. I have faith in, in, in people who dedicate themselves to a direction, but that's speaking of at most 10% of individuals in my estimation, speaking generally, of course, uh, in any given situation, setting or community, for the most part, people are interested in getting goodies and doing violence. And I'm not saying that to be cynical. I mean, you can't have real ideals unless you face life as it really is. You can't talk about possibilities unless you face circumstances as they really are. And the trash talking that goes on online, which is really where we spend the majority of our social lives, so that's life. One, mm -hmm. one may consider Twitter as reality or not reality, but it is where we dwell. <laughs> Definitely part of reality. Yeah. It's part of reality, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and <clears throat> the amount of trash talk is just appalling. And eventually it inures a person to, even if they're, you know, they always think they're protecting themselves by being anonymous, which just makes you chicken shit basically. So great. So now you're a trash talker and you're a coward. At least be a brave <laughs> trash talker and use your real name, you know, don't call yourself some, you know, it's like, being a trash yeah. talker and a coward uh, inures um, shame into a person, as it should. And the person can't deal with feeling that shame, so then he just engages in more trash talk. And I mean this universally. You know, uh, it, it can be directed against a private individual. It can be directed against somebody who posts something you don't like. I don't care if you don't like, you know, Amy Schumer or some other celebrity. You know, if you go online and you're insulting somebody, you're engaging in the same thing. It, it, trash talk for sport inflicts a kind of shame on you, especially when it's done anonymously, which is yeah. usually the case. And, um, and you will try to, you will avert that shame through more escapism and you will <laughs> fail. Your life will be dedicated to escapism, entertainment, procuring goodies, committing minor acts of violence in a, <laughs> usually in a cowardly way, like throwing a rock at somebody metaphorically or literally, and then, you know, rushing to hide behind a tree or something. And uh, is that who you want to be? Hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I think the, you know, let's go deeper into that a bit because I think the true nature of why people continue to gossip or, uh, you know, put negative things out there on social media is not truly addressing the true needs, wants, and desires mm -hmm. that are deeply embedded within. And, I recently actually read this book called Nonviolent Communication that was really helpful with that um, uh, in the sense of being able to communicate what we need and what we want in a way that is not aggressive, in a way that is not a way to demand that from other people, but in a way that is very true and to be able to communicate that to other people in a healthy way. And I mm -hmm. suggest that book. Have you read that book at all? I, I have not, but when you're done, I'll make a complimentary point um, because I groove to what you're saying. Yeah. I think that, that, that book I read twice and um, twice within, you know, the span of like a week. And uh, yeah, that was a really helpful um, piece of work. Yeah. But um. Mm. But going back into the idea, you know, this idea of the golden rule, and um, I really want to talk about the power of the mastermind. And um, I remember our last podcast, uh, you said that we can we can talk about the mastermind. It's not like Fight Club where we can't talk about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we can't talk about Fight Club, but we can talk about the mastermind. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> I mentioned Fight Club. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess I'll be uh, uh, ousted from. Uh, no, we'll let it go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, you and I are in a mastermind, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And there is, you know, I'm just going to talk about my experience from it. So like when we started talking in the mastermind, when we first started it, you were very frank and you're very honest. And I noticed that my responses, like I, I even would write some responses before beforehand, you know, like uh, when you address like goals and when you address desires, needs and wants um, and everyone goes about doing that within this, our particular mastermind. And I remember trying to, and it's just kind of the way my brain works is trying to um, be able to say specifically what I want, but I didn't, I didn't say specifically what I wanted, you know? And I think it does take a long time to, uh, to live outside of the social conditionings of what you think that people expect you to answer with what you, what you want. But from observing you, you really showed in a very honest manner about, I mean, just by simply leading by example, you know, uh, what you honestly desire and what you need and want, even if it wasn't very savory necessarily for Mm -hmm. like other people, you know? Right. Right. Um, but I think what the point that I'm trying to get across is that that also lends itself to this law of reciprocity, you know, you, by you being honest, I can observe that or not observe that. Right. I have the option to not observe it, but I observed that. And I was like, you know what? I really need to be honest with these things that I want, you know, because it is only a detriment within myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I guess um, there's no real question there, but if I did want to form that into a question, what sort of things has a mastermind taught you? Because I know you've been in multiple masterminds. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, mastermind is uh, for people who don't know it, it. It's a it's a basically a support group that Napoleon Hill recommends in Think and Grow Rich and other books of his, where you get together with as it could be as few as two like minded people or people who have similar values, whatever their outlook or walk of life or wishes, they have similar values and they get together and they exchange and share uh, needs, wishes, desires. And there's an atmosphere of mutual support where you might discuss these things. You might do things to try to help one another with ideas or, or in other ways. It's, it's, it's kind of introduced like a very subtle, but important strain into my life, almost as if you add an instrument to an orchestra and you, you know, you, you start hearing that instrument, whatever it is within the folds of the arrangement. And it's been hugely helpful to me and it's rescued me. It's given me enormous reality checks at times, maybe where I was feeling depleted or disappointed or something of that nature. And Hill insisted that it's the most likely neglected step within his success program, because we all like to take a kind of go it alone attitude and, being in a mastermind group might seem intrusive or it might make us disclosing where we'd rather be private or what have you, or it's just so easy to blow off one more, what seems at certain moments like one more meeting. But he insisted that it was absolutely a critical, critical ingredient to his program. And I found that to be really true. I mean, it's very hard to do Think and Grow Rich or Napoleon Hill's work for real um, if you just cherry pick. And the mastermind has been hugely helpful to me. I mean, all kinds of good things come out of it. I, I recharge my mood. I mean, we had a meeting yesterday, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, where I was feeling really grim and really low and, and, and I felt certain things had produced disappointments that I, uh, um, was laid Mm -hmm. low by. And, you know, we talked it through and we came up with practical ideas. We came up with ideals. We came up with insights and it really helped me and it helped me in like concrete, very real ways. So if people listening dig Napoleon Hill or they want to check out Think and Grow Rich, which I encourage, don't believe what you've heard about it, you know, draw your own conclusions face to face. And yeah. if you dig the whole mastermind idea, you know, try it. I mean, it only requires one other person. Once a week meeting, we do it over Zoom. You could do it over conference call. You could do it at a, at a coffee shop if the person's, you know, in physical proximity to you. But it, it's a step that really shouldn't be neglected. Definitely. Yeah. And I think with that being said, uh, you speak in this book about aligning yourself with the highest possible collaborators. 
Yeah. And bringing together a mastermind group, I think is very important to understand who you want in that mastermind group. Yeah. Because, yeah, because I, I mean, you know, like I, I think our mastermind group is perfect where we have four people in it. And, um, you know, I think it's like the perfect amount of time we all get to listen to each other and express our thoughts and, you know, our wants and needs and able to have a soundboard to it. And I know it's helped me tremendously. Um, something that I bring up a lot is just this idea of clarity and it's given me a lot of clarity, you know, Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and also I think, you know, when people want to check out that book, think and grow rich, you, everyone has to understand that was published in 1937. So there are some things in there that are, uh, (laughs) that that are, they're of the time to sit, to speak kind of racistly of the time. So let's just prep this with that. But the principles within it, I think, uh, are really helpful and impactful. And it's something that you've dedicated a lot of your, uh, life as a historian to bring forward to a new audience. Right, right. I, I did do a gender neutral edition of Think and Grow Rich. So if you want to read racist things in a gender neutral frame, I wanted people to have the opportunity <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, you, yeah. no, I'm Josh. Yeah, no, no I know, I know, I know you are. But, but no, I know I, you are, yeah. the book was published in 1937 and it does bear the uh, cultural hallmarks of its time. But the thing that I would ask everybody to dig, <laughs> and some people are put off by the title. I think it's one of the greatest titles ever devised. I mean, it, it, you can't help but be curious. Even if, even if it seems rancid to you, you're still a little curious. But <clears throat> the point is, it's really about concretizing ideas. You know, yeah. money is not the chief part of my wish. I need money. I need resources like everybody listening. I mean, it's definitely part of my life. But of the things I want in my life, you know, it, it falls, it's not at the top of the menu, you know, which, which, which could be seen as a weakness in certain quarters, but, but that's how it is. I mean, we got to be frank and Napoleon Hill's book, Napoleon Hill's program. If you, if you really read it and you sit with it, um, you'll see that it's about concretizing ideas and it's not just a mental program. I can always tell when journalists haven't ever read a page of it when they're like, yeah, it's the thing that underscores the secret. And it's like, no, it's not. And of all the books that Rhonda <laughs> Byrne recommends, that book is conspicuously absent. Um, mm. I'm not saying she doesn't dig it. I have no idea, but I'm just saying you will not, it's, it's not, it's, 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 it's not visibly part of that network of influences. I only mention that because there's a lot of very hands-on hardcore work in that book. There's mind metaphysics and there's also exercises that are personal, but there's also very concrete, real steps. And you've got to go out into the world and do whatever it is that you're after, whether it's financial or athletic or artistic, or whether you're a student or a soldier or whatever it is, you've got to go out into the world to be doing things. And a lot of people, I've met a lot of people from very, very different walks of life, very different political outlooks too, you know, including people who like, you know, are really polarized politically, who will tell me in private that book made a huge difference in their lives. You know, I mean, sometimes we're embarrassed about stuff like that. You know, we don't want to be seen on the subway reading Think and Grow Rich. You know, we look like, it, you know, we fear it's going to be embarrassing or it seems intellectually unserious. And, you know, Think and Grow Rich doesn't seem to go with my NPR tote bag. And this is another area where I would say just just throw out convention. Don't don't be embarrassed. Tear the cover off, you know, but yeah. read the thing, you know, read the thing. Yeah. Just listen to the audio book, you know. Yeah, put, listen to the audio <laughs> or just read it on your phone. Yeah. Nobody will know. But yeah, exactly. I do recommend having a physical copy. I, I, I do think something about the tactile experience of reading, especially when a book is meaningful to you, when it has like almost scriptural importance, think, you know, it's good to have a good physical copy. Yeah. It's been my yeah. experience. And I mean, I, I also think, you know, around that time period. So the Great Depression was from 1929 to 1933. So mm-hmm. it was directly after the Great Depression and, you know, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, right? And um, the the book came out in 1937. Mm-hmm. And from 1937 to 1938, there was a huge recession during that time period. Yeah. So I think there was a lot of people that were trying to better themselves. And I mean, this is kind of where 
the American dream comes from. And so Think and Grow Rich is very much of the time period from t- by title, but also just from ideological perspectives of what people would want to strive for, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's no question, you know, the book definitely reflects mainstream American capitalist values. I mean, it, it absolutely does. Hill does make one mention in the book that the book can be used for anything you want. And I, I, I validate that. I think that that's true. I think that that's true. So, you know, the individual, it's, it's, again, it's really about concretizing ideas. So, you know, from time to time, for some people, the cultural baggage is no problem. They like it. The title Think and Grow Rich is fine with them. I know a lot of people, a lot of educated people who wrinkle their noses at something like that. And I would say this is, you know, we all like to think of ourselves as open minded. I don't think anybody really is. I think that's one of those phrases I would like to see retired. But (laughs) but as long as it's still in use, um, it's as good an opportunity as any to say, you know, the rubber hits the road where you really have to deal with something that's challenging to your point of view. And um there are things and ideas I do not like reading. You know, I, I have an aversion to certain ideas, maybe to the point where I allow myself to get a little bit closed down. You know, this and we all have those blind spots. You know, this may be such an area. And if you're listening to this show, you obviously have an interest in developmental philosophy. So it's an opportunity to kind of challenge yourself if you haven't already and, and check out that book. Yeah, Definitely. So um, I'll just ask one more question regarding Cosmic Habit Force, but um, what are some things that you would like people to take away regarding your book and building positive habits for yourself? Uh, The thing that I would like people to take away is that you have greater resources. You're more formidable than you believe. And these things don't require any concession to cultural conformity. And I want people to look at this book and say to themselves, I can make greater choices about who I associate with in life. I don't have to be around people who are diminishing, who are cruel. I can embrace the idea of a positive mental attitude without feeling that that means putting on some sort of false, rosy personality that doesn't really belong to me because my definition of a positive mental attitude, as I use it in that book, is evaluating circumstances based on their capacity for self-development. I'd like people to realize that the extent to which we internalize voices of conformity and we, we internalize those voices so much that we don't even speak honestly and frankly to ourselves. And that if you can give yourself a break from that, take an exit ramp from that, you might be able to identify something in your life that will totally and wildly surprise you about what you really want. And don't make predictions about what that's going to be because, man, there are people in situations who think that they're really in touch with what they dig and what they're about. And it might be jarring. It might be jarring as well as incredibly ecstatic and experienced to realize that Maybe there's something you haven't acknowledged to yourself, maybe, and, and, and don't reach for an easy example. You know, maybe somebody who's Mm -hmm. told him or herself that money is not important, for example, for whatever reason, might suddenly realize, oh, wow, money is actually really important to me. Mm -hmm. And it could change the tenor of your life. Likewise, you know, some, some, uh, opposite thing could happen. Uh, Just, you, you know, throw out the predictions and, you should feel a certain joy. I mean, if any of this resonates with you, consider the possibilities that are before you. You know, you mm-hmm. might discover a fold of yourself intimately, privately, something very closely held that you never knew was was there. So that would mm-hmm. be my wish for what people would discover from yeah. the book. And and to keep an open mind, right? <laughs> let's after this we'll throw out that phrase you know it's, it's so self-congratulatory i've never met anybody who doesn't think that he or she has an open mind and yet listen you know if i was called out you know i could be called out you know for ways in which i'm authentically close-minded and 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 it, it can take a really long time to acknowledge those areas yeah yeah. No, I'm just saying that in jest. No, obviously. I did, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the most um, close minded, like, you know, bigoted people I know are like, I have an open mind, but and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> where on earth did you get that idea? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But let me shine that light on myself. You know, I mean, shame on me if I'm only looking at the next guy because 
in the book, I try to hold myself to these same circumstances and I try to be really disclosing in the book as well. Yeah. And I, I think you are. Yeah. I, it's, um, yeah, I think anyone should, it, it's a very helpful book for anyone that wants to create positive habits for themselves. And, um, and also go, it touches upon a lot of the other philosophies that, um, that you believe in that you've written about in the past. So yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. And you know, thanks for, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah. Oh, pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you, man. Yeah. Cool. All right, buddy. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.